Good morning and welcome to the Beaumont Seventh-day Adventist Church Sabbath School Song Service. It is a beautiful day to praise God in song and we're going to begin with our opening song which is number 457, I Love to Tell the Story. when we all get to heaven.
thank Darna Height for leading us out in the opening hymn entitled, I Love This Tell the Story. What an inspiring song for us, especially for those of us who desire to spread the good news about Jesus Christ. Good morning and welcome to Sabbath School at Belmont SDA Church. We thank you so much for joining us and we are especially looking forward to our lesson study a bit later on entitled The Hard Way. But first, I'm going to read scripture and it's from Isaiah 8, verses 16 to 22. And I am reading from the New International Version. Bind up this testimony of warning and seal up God's instructions among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord, who is hiding his face from the descendants of Jacob. I will put my trust in him. Here I am, and the children the Lord has given me. We are signs and symbols in Israel from the Lord Almighty who dwells on Mount Zion. When someone tells you to consult medians and spiritists who whisper and mutter, 
Should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone who does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they will roam the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upward will curse their king and their God. Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom. They will be thrust into utter darkness. So we're going to start off with opening prayer. And then I'll take the time to introduce you, our teacher for the lesson study. Please bow your heads for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you so much for getting us safely through another week and for all the rich blessings you've bestowed upon us. Thank you so much for being with us during the trials that we have faced and letting us know that you are able to make a way so we could get through it all. We ask that you will be with our teacher for the lesson study today. Please help to guide him so that we are able to grasp the concepts that are so crucial to our spiritual development and your neighbor to pray. Amen. So today's lesson entitled The Hard Way will be taught by Ben Rutten Harry. Good morning, uh, SDA Church. We welcome you to our Sabbath school lesson today. I am sure that uh, most of us have taken the time to go through. And here we are basically going through together as we pick on what we think are the main important uh, thoughts that we can share to get together this morning. I would like us to take this time to pray before we start our lesson study. Let us pray. Our kind and loving Father in heaven, we thank you this morning uh, for a wonderful day that has been given to us. We don't claim that we know everything about you, but we understand the Holy Spirit can come and help us. The one who was present when the uh, in prophets were writing and inspired by the same Holy Spirit. We therefore invite him now to come and open our ears and our eyes and our minds and even our hearts so that we can fully understand your word. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to us and for answering our prayer because we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Today we are on lesson four in our Sabbath school quarterly. Lesson four and the title is The Hard Way, The Hard Way. Just the title itself maybe could make anybody think a little bit The Hard Way. And of course, we'll be covering Isaiah chapter 7, verses 14 to 16, the same chapter, verses 17 to 25, and then chapter 8, verse 1 to 10, chapter 8, verse 11 to 15, and then chapter 8, verse 16 to 22. That is what we are going to be covering. But as you notice that as we enter into that particular chapter, uh, we, we, we find that uh, there is an important message given to Israel of the time. And I want to believe that the message is just as important today as it was then. For we notice that as we read chapter 7, and, and many of you, I'm sure you studied, you will notice that God provided powerful evidence that he wanted the best for his children. And who today would deny that even up, up to this, day, this moment, in this day and age, God wants the best for you and for me. He still does. He wants the best for us. And God wants the, be wants the best for, for the children of Israel. Unfortunately, his children rejected the warning and God had no other way except to speak to them with a roar and a flood instead. You know, I, I, I remember when I was growing up, um, I think I had the, this problem where Sometimes you might have to call my name twice or three times before I can pay attention. Uh, because once I'm doing, once I was playing with a toy or something, uh, obviously my mind would get so engrossed. And for some reason, my mom would say, Benjamin. And maybe the first time, it looks like I would hear, but I would not hear. I don't know how to best put it. It's like I'm hearing her, 
but it's not clicking so that I can stop what I'm doing. And according to this statement we are talking about here, it, that it was unfortunate that the children of Israel, though they were God's children, they rejected the warning and God had no other choice except to speak to them with a roar and a flood instead. He could have used them. And, and I remember my mom would say, Benjamin, Benjamin. And she, raised, she would have to raise her voice, Benjamin. And all of a sudden, that's when I say, yes, mom. And of course, she would give me a warning. You don't have to do this. If I call you once, you have to say yes. And you know, with God, he tried, but Israel didn't get it. And as a result, he had to use some other methods of communicating. We noticed that the word of God is fulfilled in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 15. I want to start by reading verse 15 of Isaiah. And uh, the version that I'm using today, uh, it's the, the New Living Translation. That's the one that I'm using, the New Living Translation. Uh, it might not read exactly the same way as you read um, your, um, as you read your maybe King James Version, but I'm sure it carries almost the same thought. So I'm reading from Isaiah chapter seven and I'm reading verse 15, chapter seven, verse 15. And it reads, it reads right here, by the time this child is old enough to eat curds and honey, he will know enough to choose what is right and reject what is wrong. And that is verse 15. And verse 16 says, but before he knows right from wrong, the, the two kings you fear so much, the kings of Israel and Aram will both be dead. That is the way uh, this particular version puts it. Now, we notice that uh, what was happening, I mean, we would ask the question, what exactly is happening? You are, we are being taken into a scenario in which there's, there's some figurative language here. Uh, when the boy does this, and when he starts doing this, uh, know that this, is, this incident is going to take place and this is going to happen. It's like almost like uh, prophecy. But really, God is, is basically explaining what is, going, what is going to happen. And we can ask the question, what was happening here? And the answer is, in 734 BC, the word of God foretold that before the child would be able to speak clearly and to distinguish between good and evil, the kingdoms of Israel and Syria would no longer exist. That's exactly what the Bible is saying. And we could find a text that does support that when we go to chapter 8, verse 4. That particular chapter would actually tell us uh, almost, or rather, confirm what we are saying. This, this name prophesies, this name prophesies that which a couple of years before this child is old enough to say, Papa or Mama, the king of Assyria will invade both Damascus and Samaria and carry away their riches. So we notice that this is a prophecy where it says, before this child is able to say that, that is exactly what is going to happen. And that is what uh, verse four of chapter eight tells us. So two years later in 732 BC, Syria was conquered by the Assyrian empire. In that moment, Isaiah's son was less than one year old and he could only babble. So we see exactly the timing and exactly what the Bible just talked about. That is what is happening. And 12 years later in 722 BC, Isaiah's son was able to make decisions. And then what happens? Remember what the text says, the very first text, which is chapter seven, verse 15, it said, by the time the child is old enough to eat curds and honey, he will know enough to choose what is right and reject what is wrong. But before the, he knows right from wrong, the two kings uh, you fear so much, the kings of Israel and Aram will both be dead. So keep that in mind. And so we are saying, uh, after the 732 BC, the, uh, the, those two years after, 
the Assyrian Empire came. And that moment, uh, Isaiah's son was less than one year old and he could only babble. But 12 years later, in 722 BC, Isaiah's son was able to make decisions. Then the kingdom of Israel was destroyed by Shalmanasa. Uh, you know, these are, uh, I'm sure, Hebrew names, and um, we might not be able to pronounce it exactly uh, the right way. But I would say Shalmanasa, um, the fifth, is the one who, de who, who destroyed it. Uh, the Israelites were destroyed to, were deported to Mesopotamia uh, during uh, this particular raid and this particular king, the kingdom of Israel was utterly destroyed by Shalmanasa the fifth. We could find reference of this one if we go to the book of Kings. Let me quickly get to the book of Kings and it will tell us a little bit more about, and it is found in second Kings, second Kings chapter 17. Second Kings chapter 17. Verse three to six, it says, King Shalmanasa of Assyria attacked and defeated King Hoshea. So Israel was forced to pay heavy annual tribute to Assyria. Then Hoshea conspired against the king of Assyria by, by asking King Saul of Egypt to help him shake free of Assyria's power and by refusing to pay the annual tribute to, to, to Assyria. So as you read right there in the book of Kings, 2 Kings chapter 17, you get exactly uh, the story of what happened. What happened when this uh, Shalmanasa the fifth came and Israel uh, was destroyed. And it says uh, the Israelites were deported to Mesopotamia. Um, then, uh, the king who was there, who was the king then in power? King Ahaz, his specific dilemma was the prophecy. It was like, even though he had this prophecy, he had these words from the Lord. He had a hard time making a decision. He could not fully understand. He did not comprehend what the Lord was saying. And it says, the prophecy was before the child Emmanuel would be would be old enough to decide between different kinds of food, the land would be deserted. And that is what is found in chapter seven of the book of Isaiah in the verse 16. So we learn this lesson uh, on that very first part of our Sabbath school lesson. What is the lesson? That Ahaz rejected God's help to overcome his enemies. You know, as I was analyzing that statement, that the only reason why he was not unable to overcome his enemies was that he did not choose God to be on his side. When God was talking to him, when, when God was giving a warning, when God was saying, I want to team up with you and work with you, Ahaz didn't, did, didn't take it. He, did, he didn't accept the offer that he's given. And you can imagine what it says to us. Today, God says, I want to team up with you. I do. I really do. I want to team up with you. Uh, God is not saying you're not going to face any problems. God is not saying you're not going to even experience illnesses within your, 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 your homes or your families. No, he's not saying that. He simply says, I want to team up with you so that whatever comes, and when it comes, I'm on your side. That is exactly what God is saying. So we, we see that uh, he was not ready. As a result, the people of Israel suffered because of the king's bad decision because he refused to team up with God, because he could not choose God, the rest of the nation suffered because of the choices that he made, bad choices. You know, they did not want to listen, so they had to learn the lesson the hard way. Remember that uh, the lesson uh, today is the hard way. They had to learn it the hard way. I wanna talk about the consequences of disobedience. So what happens when we disobey? There are some consequences. Remember, every time when God speaks to us, he gives conditions. And if those conditions are met by the grace of God, or even if we are humble enough to say we want to meet them, but we cannot, God says, I want to be on your side. I'll help you out. I'll help you out. Consequences of disobedience. The Lord will bring the king of Assyria. This is uh, verse 17 of chapter 7. The Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you 
and your people and your father's house, days that have not come since the day of Ephraim, that, since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. And that is what the text is saying in verse 17. If you go to Prophets and Kings, page 325, there's a statement that starts with, invitation upon invitation was sent to erring Israel to return to their, to tend to their allegiance to Jehovah. In other words, God did all that God could. Uh, God tried everything to get their attention. Uh, he was inviting them to come back to him. But the question is, did they even listen? And do you think today, in your life and in my life, could it be true and possible that God is doing everything he can to try and get our attention, inviting us, invitation upon invitation, being sent to us. You know at best we are sinners, that's all we are. And yet God says, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. What an open statement, whoever comes. But remember, we have to come with sincere hearts. We have to be sincere and genuine. When we are sincere and genuine and we go to God, God says, I'm ready. I'll take you. I'll help you. I'll clean you up. And I'll forgive all your sins. Sure enough, the prophets continued to plead with them, but they would not listen. The prophets were pleading, please come back to God. Please accept God, but they could not listen. And God had promised that he would destroy the kingdoms of Israel and Syria. Remember, as we read earlier on, uh, he said he himself would do it. He says, if this does not happen, I will destroy the kingdoms of Israel and Syria. So Ahaz did, didn't have to do anything about it. There was nothing he could do to stop it. However, Ahaz disobeyed him and formed an alliance with Assyria. He also worshipped serious gods because he believed they were more powerful than God. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Uh, I know that it sounds like sometimes when we read or uh, learn more about the historical uh, events in the Bible, we, it's very easy to look at uh, the choices that other people made and say, well, this was not really wise. You know, we, we can judge it like that. But the question is, put it more practical in your own life. Could there be other areas in your life in which God comes and God invites time and time again, and still you make the choices just as bad as the choices that were made by Ahaz, who disobeyed God and formed an alliance with Assyria. And he says he also worshiped he worshipped serious gods because he believed. You know, he actually had a conviction. He believed they were more, the gods of Assyria, of Syria were more powerful than God. And, and we can find evidence of this one. Let's find it in uh, 2 Chron Chronicles chapter 28. We should be able to find that. 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles, I'll open 2 Chronicles. Chapter 28, and I'll start from verse 22. I'm still reading the same version. Second Chronicles chapter 28, verse 22 and 23 says, And when trouble came to King Ahaz, he became even more unfaithful to the Lord. He offered sacrifices to the gods of Damascus, who had defeated him. For he said, These gods helped the kings of Ar Aram, so they will help me too, if I sacrifice to them. But instead, they led to his ruin and the ruin all of Israel. Do you notice? And so because of the choices he made, he was not the only one to suffer, but the rest of Israel did suffer together with him. And, and so we do have the proof that he disobeyed God and formed an alliance with Assyria and even worshipped those gods. Therefore, God sent Egypt and Assyria. You know, uh, we can find this one in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 20. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 20 can actually help us uh, see how then God worked it out. And, it, and we are saying he sent uh, Egypt and Assyria. 
And verse 20 says, where is verse 20? It says, in that day, the Lord will take his razor. razor. These are Syrians you have hired to protect, you have hired to protect you and use it to shave off everything, your land, your crops, and your people. Now notice, we are saying God sent Egypt in Assyria and the, the two, two nouns that I used, the fly and the bee. We find that uh, in, um, in verse 18 of the same chapter, chapter 7, verse 18, it says, in that day, the Lord will whistle uh, for the army of the for the army of Upper Egypt, for the army of Assyria, they will swarm around you like flies. Notice that, like flies. And then like bees, they will sting and kill. So, so God was going to use Egypt and Assyria, one like the fly and the other like the bee, and these were going to come against Judah. He used Assyria as a hired razor to destroy the kingdom of Judah. And of course, maybe we can learn something as we, as we continue to start this part. Maybe we can learn that we should always trust God. We should always trust God. And you know, when I say we should always trust God, I know that sounds like an obvious statement, but there are times when it's very hard to take what God is saying based on the human understanding and uh, the best of our intelligence and wisdom, we would say, this doesn't seem to work. Why is God saying this? And this is where, you know, trust comes in. Because if I'm asking you to do something and you're not very sure and you're not very confident, uh, you're only going to do it if you somehow trust me. But, you know, trusting a human being is something that we should never even think of. But it is God that we should always trust. And we are saying, we can learn something. We should always trust God because bad consequences inevitably come when we reject God and rely in people. When we decide we're not going to listen to God, we're going to do what we think is right. Well, yes, we might do that. But the question is, are we going to be successful? Is that going to help us? Are we not going to suffer in the end after having disobeyed the Lord? I want to read a verse in Psalms 146, verse 3. Listen to this one, Psalms 146, this idea of trusting in men or in people instead of trusting God. Verse 3 of Psalms 146, verse 3 says, don't put your confidence in powerful people. There is no help for you there. Wow. Don't put your confidence in people who have power, in earthly people. I mean, in people who are here on earth. I mean, they, for there is no power there, he says, there is no help for you there. Don't put your confidence in them. So clear. Don't put your confidence in them. Yes, we could also read Psalms 118. That's another one. Psalms 118, verse 9 says, It is better to trust the Lord than to put confidence in princes. It is far much better to trust the Lord than to put your confidence in human beings. That's what Psalms 118 verse 9 simply says. I want to move on to what's in a name. What's in a name? Yes, and we could uh, go to Isaiah chapter 8, and the verse is verse 8. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 8. I want to read that one. Isaiah 8 verse 8 says, this flood will overflow all its channels and sweep into Judah. It will submerge Emmanuel's land from one end to the other. A, another version says, it will spill into Judah, flooding and engulfing as it reaches to the necks of its vic victims. He will spread his wings out over your entire land, O oh, Emmanuel. God asked Isaiah to write down the name of his next son before witnesses. Although his wife had not conceived yet, God had to actually tell Isaiah 
to write that name. And I want us to read verse 1 and 2 of chapter 8. Listen to this, verse 1 and 2. It says, And again the Lord said to me, Make a large signboard and clearly write this name on it. Um, I'm going to try and pronounce the name. It's, it's Mahashalau, Mahashalau Hashbaz. Mahashalau Hashbaz. I hope I'm saying it right. Mahashalau Hashbaz. And that is the name. I asked Uriah, the priest, and Zechariah, son of uh, Jeberek, both known as honest men, to testify that I had written it before the child was conceived. So he gets the instruction, write this name down. This is the name of the boy who is going to be born. And he says it had to be written way before so that it is true that whatever God says, the meaning of the name would explain what was going to happen. And so in verse 1 and 2, it gives us the name, uh, this difficult name that I was trying to pronounce. The son would be a sign. This boy would be a sign. Verse 18 does tell us that he would be a sign. Verse 18, what does verse, say, verse 18 say? It says, verse 18 says, I and the children the Lord has given me have names that reveal the plans the Lord Almighty has for his people. Wow. So these were not ordinary names. The names have revealed the meaning. They reveal the plan that God has for his people. And so when God was telling him to write this particular name, uh, it was a name that carries exactly the plans God had for his people. Okay, let's get a little bit into that name uh, for this son who was a sign. Uh, it says, we said his name was Mahashal Hashbaz. What did that mean? Uh, it meant sp speed the spoil and hasten, hasten the valuable stolen goods. Um, there's a word also that could be used instead of uh, that phrase, valuable stolen goods, uh, hasten the booty, like B-O-O-T-Y. Uh, so basically, that is the speed, the spoil, hasten the booty, or booty, um, B-O-O-T-Y. That is the meaning of that particular name. It was a warning. Notice if that was the meaning of the name of this son, which name was already given before his wife conceived. So it had a meaning. Remember, we said God was revealing his plans through the names of the, his children. It was a warning. Assyria would conquer the lands of Syria and Israel. However, uh, Tiglath, Pilsa, the third one, came like the waters and the river and went further. He destroyed the land of Judah too. God was merciful. Even though this destruction came, even though God realized he was dealing with people who would not listen to him, but listen to this one. God was merciful. You know, this is the part that really touches me with God. One day I was reading uh, Prophets and Kings, and he was talking about how uh, the children of Israel had sinned. Remember when they uh, made that golden calf and they worshipped? And God was so upset. In fact, to the extent that he proposed that he was going to destroy all of them. But we remember that Moses prayed and prayed to God and said, Lord, I know you could do that, but the problem is your name, your name. Those nations are going to say God intended to take them to the promised land, but he failed and then he decided to destroy them. And for that reason, God forgave them. There was a statement that Spiritual prophecy says, and God forgave them still. And, and that statement really touched, touched me. I said, wow, uh, God still goes on to that, that extent of uh, forgiving us, even when we really don't even deserve it. And God forgave. And we are saying here, God was merciful. He let him. He reached up the neck, only saw Judah 
was not completely destroyed. Uh, all right. Sorry, there was a technical fault here. So we are saying here, God was merciful and he let him, and um, I mean, he reached up to the neck only. So Judah was not completely destroyed. The remnant was saved. God saved them. There were a few who, so God was so merciful and that he still would save a remnant. Let us read from Prophets and Kings, page 27, uh, paragraph, I mean, uh, page 27, page, oh, okay, it, it, it's uh, Prophets and Kings, page 330. And I read this quote, but in Judah, there dwelt some who maintained their allegiance to Jehovah. You know, even when the rest of us might be swept away with the winds of doctrine or be swept away by the cunning methods that the devil uses against us, there's just a faithful few. Wouldn't you pray, you and me, that we be find, found in the few who are still faithful? According to this uh, particular quote says, but in Judah, there dwelt some who maintained their allegiance to Jehovah, steadfastly refusing to be led into idolatry. It was to these that Isaiah and Micah and their associates looked in hope as they, survey, as they surveyed the ruin wrought during the last years of Ahaz. Their sanctuary was closed, but the faithful ones were assured, wow. Though the sanctuary was closed, do you know of any time when the sanctuary has been closed during your lifetime? The place we used to come and meet, the place we used to worship together, the times when we were free to do it and nobody knew. But let me tell you something, God is really concerned about those who are true and faithful, those who are genuine and sincere. For it says here, their sanctuary was closed, but the faithful ones were assured. What was the assurance? God is with us. Amen. There are hard times that are coming. Believe me, we have hard times ahead of us. But here is the assurance. It doesn't matter what we're going to go through. It doesn't matter what you are going through right now. I might not know it. You might not know what I'm going through, but listen to this. Here is the blessed assurance. God is with us. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread and he shall be for a sanctuary. He shall be for a sanctuary. So what we need the most is the Lord, our God, to be on our side. I want to move on. I want to move on to nothing to fear when we fear God himself. Nothing to fear when we fear God himself. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 13. is another text that we can look at. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 13. Verse 13. I read verse 13, it says, do not fear anything except the Lord Almighty. He alone is the Holy One. If you fear him, you need fear nothing else. I'm still using that version, not King James Version. So do not fear anything except the Lord Almighty. He alone is the Holy One. If you fear him, you need fear nothing else. So nothing to fear when we fear God himself. You know, God advised Isaiah not to do what most people do, not to be afraid of what most people are afraid of, and not to fear what most people fear. In other words, do you think that's more applicable during our time? I think so. What are our fears these days? I might ask, what do you think we are most afraid of? Well, I would say we are afraid of the pandemic because we have seen we've lost many lives. Our loved ones have, lo have gone because of the pandemic. And what else are we afraid of? 
We are also afraid because we don't know what's coming. Remember when Jesus was speaking, he says, men's hearts will fail them for fear of those things that are to come. Sometimes we, we can just imagine what might happen tomorrow. We might just imagine what might happen to us or to our children or our grandchildren. And just that imagination might kill us. For men's hearts will fail them for fear. And, and, and the word of God is in, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid of what they're afraid of. God is the only one we should, we should hallow and obey. He's the only one who can fear, respect, and even be afraid of, you know, when we're talking about fear here, we're talking about obey, we'll be talking about respect. Verse 13, we truly fear God by acknowledging that he is the supreme power of the universe. How do we fear God? We fear him by acknowledging that God is the supreme power of the universe. That is the fear of the Lord. And remember Solomon says, for the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So the, way, the best way to fear the Lord is to acknowledge him as the supreme power of the universe. If he is with you, I mean, imagine if he's the supreme power of the universe and that same God is with you. Well, if he is with you, Nobody can hurt you without his permission. Wow, I love that. Nobody can hurt you. With, if God is against you because you have rebelled against him, then you should be afraid of him. You have every reason to be afraid. Because number one, who is going to protect you from him? Which power are you going to stand with? Who is going to help you? King Ahaz tried it, but it didn't work. Our minds must be stayed upon God and we must not fear the fear of the wicked. I'm, I'm reading, this is a quote uh, from uh, Early Writings, page 60. It says, our minds must be stayed upon God and we must not fear the fear of the wicked. That is fear what they fear and reverence what they reverence, but be bold and valiant for the truth. Could our eyes be opened, we should see forms of evil angels around us, trying to invent some new way to annoy and destroy us. And we should also see angels of God guarding us from their power. For God's watchful eye is ever over Israel for good. And he will protect and save his people if they put their trust in him. Amen. End of quote. Definitely. That is what God is able to do. I like the passage, and, and we should also see angels of God. While we can see things that frighten us, that make us afraid, what we might not see, if only God would open our, our eyes, we would see also the angels of God. For God's watchful eye is ever over Israel for good, and you protect and save his people if they put their trust in him. We ought to trust in him and nothing more. We have to trust in God. I want to move on to gloom of the ungrateful living dead. Isaiah chapter 8, in verse 19 says, they will say to you, seek oracles at the pits used to, con to conjure up underworld spirits from the magicians who chirp and mutter in, in in uh, incantations should people not seek oracles from their gods by asking the dead about the destiny of the living yeah a question is posed right there in verse 19 are we supposed to ask dead people to tell us about maybe the future of those who are still alive or the the day-to-day -day running of everything asking the dead to actually tell us what about our God? What about asking a God who has always who has always been there and who always been there from everlasting to everlasting? And it says, don't believe the lies. Don't believe that most people in Judah and, and most people in Judah and Ahaz himself followed a religion based on idolatry. 
divination and worshipping the dead. All this went against the law and the testimony. Verse 20 would actually tell us the same thing. This kind, these kinds of beliefs are still around us. Idols may not be worshipped openly, but our culture is full of beliefs about the dead, communicating with the living and deciding or foretelling their future. Do you know that? Our culture, and guess what? Yes, we will say our culture here. I come from a different place, and I know they also believe the same thing. The devil has done a good job in spreading the same false gospel, making people believe that the dead somehow have power to tell those who are living what's going to happen and how they can protect themselves. And he has done a wonderful job as based on his, on his plans and his cunning methods. But the truth is that it is a lie. Do not believe those lies. Do not. Spiritualism, modern sorcery, and new age spread this message all around. They continue to spread that message where we end up thinking the dead are more superior. They are like gods. They are able to tell us what might happen tomorrow. And if we wanted protection, we might actually get the protection from those who are dead. You know, it's very interesting. If a person comes to you and says, I dreamt yesterday my father who died, and he said some words to me. And the person might really, because you loved your father, you might tend to cherish those words. And you might think that uh, this must be very authentic, some very serious information I have to take, to, 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 to take note of. Uh, and, and we are, we seem to lean so much towards what dead people have said or might say more than leaning towards God who has been there from everlasting to everlasting. One who would not even die. We must base our beliefs on the Bible alone and reject those subtle lies firmly. Rejecting them is a matter of loyalty to God. We, we have to make a decision. Um, we cannot be in between. This is the truth, and this is the problem that Ahaz and the people who lived during that time faced. We cannot entertain the thoughts. We cannot entertain the, the beliefs in idols and the worship of, the worship of, uh, of, uh, of dead people and the communication that, uh, that they have with dead people. We cannot, we cannot entertain those things. We have to make our own choice. I want to read again from um, This Day with God, March 14, by E.G. White. It says, every individual must seek by earnest prayer to know the word of God for himself and then do it. In all your temporal concerns, in all your, your cares and anxieties, wait upon the Lord. Amen. Yes, wait upon the Lord. Put not your trust in princes nor in the sons of men, because they may be in positions of trust. The Lord has united your heart with him. If you love him and are, and are accepted in his service, bring all your burdens, both public and private, to the Lord and wait upon him. May the Lord bless us this morning as we continue to think seriously about the decision. If you, as you notice this, this lesson, which was entitled The Hard Way, we have a choice. Uh, we can let God communicate with us the hard way or the easiest way with his sweet voice and the good and the several invitations that he's giving to you and me right now. And may we give our hearts. May we come to him. May we pray that he might give us those hearts that are so humble, accepting that there is nothing good in us, Father. Help us, draw us close to yourself. And when we do so, when we do so, God is faithful. I like, I like the verse found in the book of Numbers that says, God is not man that he would lie, nor the son of man that he can change his mind. When he has made a promise, he will make it come to pass. Let us pray. Our kind and loving Father in heaven, Thank you so much for the opportunity to come together and study your word. We know very well there is nothing good in us. 
We have nothing to offer you, but we come. Spiritual prophecy says, Jesus loves to have us come to him just as we are. And so, Lord, we are coming to you just as we are. We're coming to you. And we come to you sincerely and genuinely, believing and trusting that as we continue to come, and as we come wholeheartedly, you will accept us. You will forgive us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to thank Ben, Root, and Heron for the engaging Sabbath school lesson. He did an outstanding job in helping to illuminate a lot of the critical concepts that will help us to grow spiritually. Now, we're going to take some time to go over this special feature video presentation entitled One Year in Mission. And it's based on an evangelism project that's based out of Lujan, um, Argentina. So now um, I'm going to share the screen. My guest is Shanina, who is a one year in mission volunteer here in the city of Lohan in Argentina. Now this is a city of more than 100,000 people where there are no Seventh-day Adventist believers, no churches, and we are standing in a center of influence that is making a difference in the community. Thank you so much for joining me. Now, one year in mission, what exactly is that? Eh, un año en misión tiene como objetivo eh, promocionar ¿sí? el servicio voluntariado a nivel de, de para los jóvenes. ¿sí? Entonces los jóvenes deciden entregar un año de su vida al servicio del Señor. Ok, so why did you decide to give one year in mission to come to this city? Eh, desde niña, ¿sí? me, motivaba, me motivaba mucho eh, las historias misioneras. Sí, de África, de la India, y eso fue creciendo cada día más en mi corazón y el tener el deseo de, de llegar a ser misionera algún día. ¿sí? Y hace siete años que decidí entregar mi vida al servicio del Señor y este año eh, estoy aquí en Luján. Ok, so Shanina, you are not here alone, you're part of a team. Describe the team and what sort of activities you're involved in. Eh, somos un grupo de, de nueve misioneras ¿sí? que está trabajando acá en, en, en Luján, nueve chicas. Eh, las actividades eh, en el centro, ¿sí? durante el día, eh, brindamos talleres gratuitos para la comunidad, eh, como idiomas, inglés, portugués, eh, bordado mexicano, manualidades, taller de la memoria para adultos. Pero en un minuto antes de, de comenzar el taller, tenemos una partecita eh, con un mensaje espiritual, ¿sí? una frase o un versículo que meditamos con los alumnos antes de comenzar eh, cada taller. Eso es durante el día y durante la noche, el eh, lunes, martes y miércoles, ofrecemos eh, talleres de salud ¿sí? en, de siete y media a ocho y media de la noche ¿sí? para... Para los adultos. Wonderful. Now, uh, can you tell me the story or a story of someone whose life has been touched through this center of influence and through the One Year in Mission team? La historia de Emiliano, sí, es lo que más me, me, me gusta porque él llegó a, al centro de influencia para participar de un curso de, de cinco, un plan de cinco días para dejar de fumar. ¿sí? Esa fue la primera vez que él ingresó acá y gracias a ese curso él pudo dejar de dejar de fumar y en ese último día se hizo la invitación no es cierto para aquellos que querían participar del taller de enriquecimiento espiritual y él decidió y justamente hoy tuvimos la lección eh, que hablábamos acerca del sábado del día de reposo y, y después de la de terminar la lección él salió decidido a, a obedecer los mandamientos de Dios inclusive el día sábado, que para él fue algo nuevo, no, no lo conocía. Entonces descubrirlo hoy, eh, eso me, me enriqueció mucho y es el primero que ya está asistiendo a, a los, a los, al culto de los sábados a la mañana. So, Shanina, what has been the most rewarding aspect of the work that you're doing here? 
Eh, para mí lo más gratificante el estar hoy acá eh, trabajando en un centro de influencia, porque es mi segunda experiencia trabajando en un centro de influencia, es, eh, es trabajar con el método de Cristo. Es hacer lo que Jesús hizo cuando estuvo acá en la tierra, es hacerse amigo de las personas, eh, ganarse su confianza, atender sus necesidades y después decirle, seguidme. Entonces, el estar hoy acá trabajando en este mismo lugar es sentirme eh, como se sintió Jesús acá al, al trabajar. Wonderful. Now, this is not the first time that you have volunteered. Uh, you're a one year in mission, missionary this year. What have you been doing in the past? Eh, a, los diez, cuando, a los 19 años, sí, tuve mi primera experiencia como misionera en, en Paraguay. Y, y de ahí fue creciendo más el deseo de querer seguir siendo misionera. ¿sí? Eh, estuve trabajando el, en Paraguay, después volví, trabajé cinco años acá en Argentina. Eh, el año pasado estuve en, en Chile, ¿sí? en el proyecto Un Año en Misión a nivel su, de Sudamérica, representando a la Unión Argentina. Eh, y este año, bueno, decidí eh, seguir entregando mi vida al servicio del Señor. Y algo que me motiva eh, a seguir haciendo porque quiero que Jesús ya venga. Entonces, sé, sé que yo haciendo este trabajo estaré apresurando más la venida del Señor. So, what is your greatest hope for what will happen in this city? Eh, mi sueño para Luján es ver eh, plantada la iglesia adventista en este lugar. ¿Sí? Y con eso me, me sentiría realizada, ¿sí? de, de venir y que quede realmente la, la iglesia en, es, en este lugar. Wonderful. And what are your plans for the future? Eh, mis planes para el futuro es seguir siendo voluntariada, de seguir trabajando en el voluntariado, y mi sueño es eh, ser voluntaria en África. Wonderful. Shanina, thank you so much for sharing with us today. Muchas gracias. And viewers at home, it is a challenging thing to move into a new city where there are no Adventist believers and start a centre of influence and be a putting, putting Christ's method of ministry into practice. And this group of young people need our prayers. Uh, they're, in, they're enthusiastic, they have wonderful ideas and they're doing wonderful things. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Darna Height, for giving, leading out, basically, and the closing hymn. It's such a beautiful song. And so now we're going to close out this Sabbath school, and I'm going to give the closing prayer. Please bow your heads for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for a lovely time that we've had to spend together today. We had a chance to learn so much about what you wished us to get through our lesson study today. We've learned a lot about a mission project that is going on in Argentina and the enthusiasm that people have to spread your word. Please bless us and keep us, help us to be able to apply some of the principles that we learned in the lesson today to our lives so that we can better serve you. In your name I do pray, amen. <laughs>